Hey, everybody. Welcome to Daniel Davis Deep Dive coming to you live from Washington, D.C. again. And folks, we have one of the fan favorites here today. We got Colonel Doug McGregor. Uh, he is a uh, decorated, highly decorated combat veteran whom I have personally observed under fire. Uh, he is an author of five books and the CEO of Our Country, Our Choice. Doug, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks very much, Dan. Hey, and also I want to point out before we even get started with what we're going to talk about today, you've got a, a pretty big deal tomorrow night on Rumble where you're going to be interviewing uh, Robert F. Kennedy, uh, presidential candidate. I don't know if you could tell us a little bit about that, kind of give us a little preview. Well, the, the interview was conducted on Friday evening. Uh, so you're, you're seeing something that's already been done. And I, I think we were very fortunate at our country, our choice to uh, talk to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as long as we did. And it, it, the whole thing revolved around our position that we want to try and unite Americans across party lines on the basis of commonality. In other words, issues that we can agree on, one of which, of course, is ending these pointless overseas adventures and enforcing the law and securing the border and so forth. So really, it's, it was an opportunity for Mr. Kennedy to really respond to those, and he does. And it lasts uh, about 40 minutes. And he tells us also a great deal about himself and about his feelings. So I think people will enjoy it. This was not designed to hammer away at uh, RFK Jr. You know, that's not why we did it. We said, look, we have some something in common. We want to do some of the same things you do. Would you tell us why? And how you plan to do it. So I think yeah, people, I, I'm I, really looking forward to it. I, I've uh, always been a fan of, of uh, his, his father of, of JFK. This, uh, everybody's got some flaws, but man, there was so many great things about them that I wish were in our leaders today. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what he has to say. So I'm glad you're doing this. Yeah. I think, I think people will enjoy it, Dan. I think you will too. I'm definitely sure I will. But today we have some other hot topics to talk about here, and uh, we're probably going to delve into a little bit of controversies because, uh, you know, just some things that are in, in the news, especially if it has anything to do with Israel, are really touchy, and a lot of people are afraid to touch certain subjects. But we're not going to do that here. We're going to we're going to say, hey, we're just going to talk honestly and truthfully about the circumstances and situations and take take a look at what's going on, what could have the impact for the United States and what we should be doing, what makes sense. Uh, especially in this current environment with this war between Israel and Hamas. And I specifically want to look at, at an aspect, uh, basically looking at what is the Israeli end state. And the reason why I wanted to talk to you about this is because this is one of the common themes that you've talked about for decades. And, and through all of your books, you always say before anybody gets into a conflict, they always need to have a view of the end state ahead of time so that they know that what the things that they're doing actually contribute to it and, and don't take away from it. As we've talked many times, Doug, that that's one of the areas of the United States' biggest weakness is the absolute failure to even set an end state, much less an attainable one. But we'll leave that for another day. Today, we want to talk about what is Israel's going to do. And as I see it, there's three general outlines of what it could be. It could be we are going to go to basically a negotiated settlement and say, OK, uh, we're going to hammer Hamas, but then we're going to have some sort of negotiated settlement to end the conflict. Not not unlike what they've done in some of the previous four uh, wars against Hamas in, in the Gaza Strip. Or they can say, we're going to just kind of go back to something like the status quo ante and, and what it was before so that we can at least get this, you know, settled down for some number of years. And then I think the third one is that some version of a actual genocide where they drive all of the uh, uh, Palestinian people out of the strip or they make it uninhabitable so that they have to leave or, or that somebody else has to take them or so. And that's very controversial. And so, first of all, let's take a look at what actually Netanyahu himself has said, because he's given some clues as to what they might be doing. Here's what he said on this topic very recently. All Hamas operatives and terrorists must die. Our forces are acting above and beneath the ground, targeting them. We are going to continue full force. We are going to continue until victory. And I have warned Hezbollah, don't make that mistake and enter the war. Now, many people are saying, well, that kind of sounds like you're talking about genocide because you're talking about taking out Hamas. But obviously, everybody else in the, in the, in the meantime is also getting killed in large numbers in the Palestine. An American congressman from New York says that's nonsense. The notion that Israel is committing ethnic cleansing and genocide is absurd. And keep in mind that the critics of Israel have been accusing Israel of committing genocide 
long before the conflict. You know, Israel is in an enormously complicated situation. If you believe, as I do, that Israel has the right to defend itself, in order to defend itself, it has to drive Hamas out of power. If Israel were to keep Hamas in power, it would run the risk of an even deadlier terrorist attack against its own people in the future. And Israel cannot afford a Hamas that's empowered to perpetrate deadly terrorist attack against its own people. The highest responsibility of any government is to protect its people. At a, uh, a press conference the other day, uh, someone had the temerity to ask uh, Kurt John Kirby, are we supporting a genocide? He got a little testy. This word genocide is getting thrown around in a pretty inappropriate way by lots of different folks. Uh, what Hamas wants make no mistake about it, is genocide. They want to wipe Israel off the map. They've said so publicly more than one occasion. In fact, just recently. And they've said that they're not going to stop. What happened on the 7th of October is going to happen again and again and again. And what happened on the 7th of October? Murder, slaughter of innocent people in their homes or at a music festival. That's genocidal intentions. Yes, there are too many civilian casualties in Gaza. Yes, the numbers are too high. Yes, fam too many families are grieving. And yes, we continue to urge the Israelis to be as careful and as cautious as possible. That's not going to stop from the president right on down. But Israel is not trying to wipe the Palestinian people off the map. Israel's not trying to wipe Gaza off the map. Israel's trying to defend itself against a genocidal terrorist threat. So when we're going to start, if we're going to start using that word, fine, let's use it appropriately. And there are those outside the United States who are not so easily convinced who say, hmm, yeah, let's actually look at that definition of genocide and see how it actually applies to the law. As the United Nations mourns the death of more than 100 staff members in Gaza, the UN's host country and largest donor is being sued for its role in the war. United States President Joe Biden, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin are accused of failing to prevent and aiding and abetting genocide. The lawsuit in federal court was filed by a nonprofit legal organization. They have a significant responsibility under customary international law, under federal law, uh, to prevent this genocide, to stop supporting this genocide. And every step of the way, at every opportunity, they have failed. Now, everybody has their different interpretations and different definitions of what's legitimate. I, I think that it's pretty fair to say that in all of those comments by each of those, the two different sides there, there's some legitimate, uh, honest statements in there. But then there's also some other questions that maybe one side or the other doesn't answer, like proportionality or, you know, what does it mean to go after the legitimate target of the Hamas terrorist who slaughtered a lot of Israeli people, et cetera. Now, let's take a look at the map. This is published in the Washington Post just today. Uh, which graphically depicts where the destruction is going on so far. And it's stunning when you look at those maps there, especially the close-up of the northern part of Gaza City. Uh, such a massive portion of the, of the city has been uh, almost completely wiped out. And just let you see what those orange areas actually look like. Gary, if you could roll that footage there, this is what it is. So when you see that, this this kind of destruction is going on all over. And it certainly... Doug, it gives the possibility for some people to say, hey, this is genocide. You're not having targeted operations. This is not, you know, clearing room by room, but just wiping out buildings in most cases. Uh, and so it seems that maybe some could say there is some justification for that. But the bigger question I think that we'd like to discuss today is what is sustainable? What can Israel do? What should they do? And what do you think they are doing? Are they doing genocide? And if not, what should they be doing? Well, in 1914, when the First World War broke out, <clears throat> the president of France was asked, how long do you think this war will last? And he said, well, six months. And the journalist was puzzled by that. He said, how can you be so certain that the war will be over in six months? He said, because that's when the money will be gone. There will be nothing left to finance the fighting with. Had we closed our uh, credit markets to the French and the British, as we did against uh, the Germans, Russians, and others, it's possible the war would have ended when he said it would because they simply couldn't afford to fight much longer. You have a somewhat similar situation in Israel right now. The Israeli economy has, by any measure, tanked. You know, you've got hundreds of thousands of men mobilized that otherwise would be at work within the framework of the Israeli economy. Uh, so I think Israel is being 
has been placed on life support by Washington. We're pumping billions of dollars into Israel uh, at this point, not so much for military assistance and support, although some of it is, but to keep the economy afloat. So the first question is, how much longer can we do that? Well, if you listen to Janet Yellen, we can do that in perpetuity. But anyone looking at our financial condition at this point and our own economy raises questions about just how long that can go on. If, if that were the case and Yellen was right, we would continue to send hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine. And I think it's pretty obvious that that period is over. We cannot afford it. Yeah. So that's the first thing. Can't, we can't afford it for very long. Uh, the Israelis can't afford it right now. Now, number two, we've got two implacable enemies. We could spend hours talking about who, who started what. Yeah. But I think we should remember something that George Marshall said to Harry Truman. When Truman was president and he was being lobbied to support uh, the creation of the Israeli state, uh, he called in George Kennan and uh, George Marshall. And both of them, in so many words, said, if you support the founding of the Israeli state, we are looking at probably a century of warfare ahead hmm. because the, the Jewish state will never be accepted by the people that live in the region. Gosh, that turned out to be pretty accurate. The Israelis have coped with this very well, obviously to a large extent because of our ability to provide them with superior military technology and support. But there are limits to this. Now, the third thing is, what's the end state? To go back to your original question, well, the desired end state in Israel is for all the Arabs to be gone from Gaza. Let's be frank, that's what they would like to see. What you're watching uh, in northern Gaza is the systematic destruction of the infrastructure, buildings and houses that make it abundantly clear, if you lived here, you can't come back because there's nothing to come back to. Right. Then you have to sort of recall Mr. Netanyahu's remarks about who is going to secure Gaza after the war. And he made it very clear, anybody who thinks others are going to come here and do this for us is crazy. We'll secure the place. We'll run it. We'll make sure nothing like Hamas ever comes back. Finally, how do you ensure that Hamas never comes back? Well, you, you can't kill everybody in Hamas. I know that sounds like, well, why not? There are only 25, 30,000 fighters left in Hamas, maybe a few thousand more. We don't know. Well, it's very simple. Rooting them out in this environment, in this urban terrain, is an impossibility, frankly. You're not yeah. going to get them all. Secondly, Hamas is an idea. Remember, Hamas is a sort of the armed arm of the Muslim Brotherhood. So right. you're going to kill this idea. In fact, if anything, the idea that the Israelis and their state should be driven out of the region uh, is probably stronger now than it's ever been in the last 75 years. That's the perverted part about this. Yeah, they, they've yeah. been they wanted to try to make it safe. And that's one thing uh, Netanyahu has said from the outset. But it's he's like he's oblivious to the fact that when you s kill so many people in the process, all you do is create additional enemies and even deeper embed the idea that they hate Israel. So how does he think that's ever going to end up with peace? I don't really think he's thought that through. Well, what, well, that may or may not be true. Uh, he may see it a little differently from you and me, because right now he exerts a, a level of control and influence over Washington, over the uniparty that governs our country and the White House, that uh, is is absolutely undeniable. Uh, you know, let's let's be be frank. You know, the the Israeli lobby, its its supporters, people who are Christian fundamentalists, or all sorts of individuals involved in this. But you've got to also look at the influence in the media, the financial markets, uh, and the government, the numbers of people who populate the government who are sympathetic to Israel. I, I think he has not absolute power over us, but certainly power mm -hmm. over us that we do not have over him. Uh, this yeah. is the case of the tail wagging the dog. We're the dog and we're being wagged. The question it does, it does appear, though, that there's there's maybe a shift going on uh, that there has been just and, and there was initially just blanket support for Israel. Anyone who said anything different was immediately accused of being an anti-Semite and, sh and shut down. No one wanted to talk about anything. But the more these images keep coming out, and especially the other day, the you know, lots of these little premature babies were that had to be evacuated because the hospital was shut down. People are now starting to go, hmm. Hang on just a second. So I perceive there's a shift coming, which may lessen uh, Netanyahu's ability to, you know, control us to wag the dog, so to speak. And I'm curious to what you think impact that may have operationally. 
Well, that may be true. Uh, that's hard to gauge yeah. because there's a lot of money involved. <laughs> and uh, you can you can affect it. You know, I, who was it? Israeli military attache a few years ago who was overheard in a restaurant in Washington saying, oh, we can deliver Congress on any issue. Uh, I think they're still there. Uh, now, as you say, can that change? I, I suppose so. But I think from Mr. Netanyahu's vantage point, this is the time to strike. He's got unparalleled power and influence over us that he probably also realizes will not endure forever. So what he's got to do is, is press ahead with the plan to remove the population from Gaza. And that's what you're seeing. Now, is he going to try and recover the hostages? Of course. Is he going to try and weed out and kill Hamas fighters? Of course. But that's like picking out a school of fish in an ocean. So what's your solution? If you can't get to the school of fish, you drain the ocean. The ocean is being drained. Now, other people are talking about offshore oil and gas and so forth. No doubt some of that is there, but that's not driving this. What's driving this is the understanding that there are irreconcilable differences between the Arab population and the Jews who live in Israel, period. But and so the, now what, what to looking at the people in the region, the, the practicalities of that, I mean, let's for the moment, let's just take the, the morality out of it about the, you know, the Palestinian people who are themselves innocent for the most part of, of what's been going on there. And they're a victim, just like the Israeli citizens were a victim. But then you have the bigger issue. Let's, as that map showed, there's already a massive amount of infrastructure been destroyed. And you can imagine when they move south into Khan Yunus and whatever else, or even finish in Gaza, that the, even more areas are going to be uninhabitable. You can see in the, the southern part of there on the map, it's so far, there's just a little bit. But man, when they start moving into their south in big ways, that orange sea is probably going to spread down there. So the question is, where will these people live when this is all over, even if they try to drain the swamp, so to speak, to get the, the fishes, which they can't ultimately succeed. But you have Egypt and, and, and uh, uh, Jordan and, and any of the other states in the region are still adamantly saying, no, we're not going to uh, take all these people so that you can just get rid of your problem. So if they don't, if they stay with that, then you seem to have you seem to be you're moving towards something that can't be attained. And then what do you have there? Uh, I don't think uh, Mr. Netanyahu and his government agree with you. I think they see the complete removal of the population from Gaza as attainable. They really believe that. And they think that it can be pushed into Egypt or from their standpoint that they could care less what happens. In other words, he and his government want to present the world with a fait accompli, that uh, it's done. Uh, there, There's nothing left in Gaza. There's nothing left to return to. Whoever was there is gone, and they're willing to sustain the public uh, ridicule and condemnation to get this job done because, in their view, if they don't do this, uh, what's happened in Gaza will happen again and again and again. And by the way, no one's paying a lot of attention right now, but there's a lot of pressure being uh, exerted on the Palestinians and the or Palestinian Arabs on the West Bank. Right. Thousands have been arrested and incarcerated. Remember, we think that when this thing began, there were five or 6,000 Palestinian Arabs held largely without trial in Israeli prisons. Now, I don't know what this current prisoner swap will do. And uh, I know that I personally hope for a ceasefire because I'm afraid that this is attainable. They can drive everyone out of Gaza, but then they will face something that they have never faced before. Israel has always been able to manipulate various states and countries and peoples in the region against each other to play them off. Uh, that's not going to work this time. You now have a, a degree of awareness of what's happening that has never existed before. We live in a world, as you point out, of, of communications that are almost instantaneous. You can't conceal the disaster that's unfolding. And you have millions of Turks and millions of Iranians and uh, hundreds of millions of Arabs, all of whom are absolutely enraged. And they're not just enraged at the Israelis, they're enraged at us because they know that we could stop this. And the only way to stop it would be for the president of the United States to simply tell Mr. Netanyahu, either you cease and desist or we withdraw all of our military power. And then you'll be left to face Hezbollah alone, along with potentially other actors in the region. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, if I could, just to speak to other actors in the in the region, 
a couple of days ago, you tweeted out an estimated 4,500 children have died. Okay, you've killed over 10,000 Arabs. You've made your point. Turkey will not stand by and watch this happen. It's time to sit down and negotiate some sort of solution. It's time to stop the bloodshed. So what do you think is that Turkey could end up doing if this fait accompli is attempted even, even forget about whether it's successful, what if it's attempted and they really do start doing, how long will Turkey or any of the other Arab regimes, will they always sit out and not do anything? Well, the answer is no, they won't. But things have changed in that part of the world. Mr. Erdogan is viewed widely inside the Sunni Islamic world as de facto Sunni leader of Islam. In other words, uh, the Arabs who historically have mixed feelings about the Turks, nevertheless feel some degree of pride that Erdogan leads a powerful state whose presence in NATO gives weight to their interests simply because they are all Muslims. And Mr. Erdogan never misses the opportunity to make the point, we are all Muslims. He's even go, gone so far now as to make that point about the Iranians. And historically, Turks and Persians have not been on particularly good terms. Right. Uh, but now the Iranians are sitting there. And, and the interesting part about Iran is Americans have been fed this steady diet of hatred towards Iran. Iran's the evil incarnate and the source of all trouble. Well, the truth is that most Iranians could care less what happens, uh, and they are not anti-Israeli. Uh, there, there's a different history there, and the Iranians are not necessarily pro-Arab, but they are now confronting something that's very different. They want to be a leader in the Islamic world. You can't be a leader in the Islamic world and watch this unfold and do nothing. So Iran is prepared. Iran is not going to field an army that marches into Jerusalem. They can't do it. They don't have it, but they do have an arsenal of uh, tactical and theater ballistic missiles and cruise missiles, as well as unmanned systems that could devastate Israel. They will not do anything unless they are directly attacked by the Israelis or us. So for the right. moment, that's the status in Iran. Turkey is very different. The Turks have a long martial history. They have a very capable army. They can raise uh, their force levels to 2 million men in the army in the space of 30 days. Uh, something like 60% of the population is under the age of 30. They have a very large manpower pool. And like the Iranians, the Turks have also become far more sophisticated technologically. They are building their own armored forces. They are building their own weapons. They are trying to build their own fighter aircraft. And recently, they attempted to compensate for uh, their needs in the aerospace community by buying Eurofighters from uh, Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom, Spain. And the Germans said, no. We won't support that. We will not sell you these Eurofighters. Well, this is probably in many ways for Erdogan the last straw. He sees himself and he sees the Muslim cause as being treated as a second or third class citizen within the framework of both the EU and NATO. So I don't think there are, there are any lingering doubts in his mind as to where he stands and to what he's going to have to do. And in his most recent remarks, he said several things. He said, first of all, no matter what number of nuclear weapons you think you have, there are not enough to prevent you from going under Mr. Netanyahu. You will be gone. You will not survive this. So he's made that very clear. Why? Because he knows that if he needs those nuclear weapons, that he can get them from Pakistan. The Pakistanis have made that very clear on numerous occasions. Mm. They've always had a good relation relationship with the Anatolian Turks. This goes all the way back to the post-war area. Turkey was seen as a model for many Muslim states, not, not the least of which was Pakistan for the future. So the Pakistanis have made that clear. It's not impossible that Mr. Erdogan would come out publicly and say, just for everyone's information, we have now warheads that are weaponized on missiles. We have a nuclear capability. I wouldn't be surprised if he did that because he's also castigated the Israelis for not admitting that they have nuclear weapons. Yeah. that they have violated the non-proliferation treaty. The Turks and the Iranians have both backed away from this. The Iranians, in fact, have shifted their emphasis to conventional warheads and conventional missiles away from nuclear weapons because they, they saw very little advantage to having a nuclear weapon. But they now have the capability to deter the Israelis by simply saying, you, you want to attack us with a nuke? You can watch Haifa 
Tel Aviv and most of the inhabited areas of Israel vanish. We will does, does their conventional weapons give them the ability to have that kind of accurate destruction? I'm, I'm not familiar with just yes. how strong I mean, that is. This is the thing, and you and I have talked about this before. There's a failure to understand that many of the advantages that we enjoyed in 1990 and 91 no longer exist. Yeah. That technology is proliferated, and the technology of precision is in the hands of the Iranians and the Turks. And of course, the Turks have the largest, supposedly the largest unmanned systems inventory when it comes to so-called drones in the world. Now, their drones are not necessarily as good in many cases as the Iranians. And the Iranians have helped the Russians enormously right. with their technology. So, but, but in other areas, the Turks have tremendous advantages. My point is that the Israelis have enjoyed two critical advantages. They've enjoyed support from us. In the past, it was not unconditional. Presidents set limits. You can go this far and no further. We will not allow you to do X, Y, and Z. That's gone. Con support from us is now unconditional. And Mr. Netanyahu knows that. That's what he wants to exploit. <clears throat> They've also had this nuclear capability, and everybody knows it. They have it aboard their submarines. They have it uh, delivered from the air. They may have the ability to do it on the ground with some of their missiles. But the point is, that could go away very suddenly and very quickly. And yeah, the so the, looking at looking back at the Turkey issue, what two things? What might cause a, 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 a I guess an action? from uh, from Erdogan to actually move against Israel, or would he actually go that far? And the second, whatever he might do, what about all the U.S. like it in Cyrillic? I mean, how, how would all that play out? Because that could really complicate everything for Washington. Uh, absolutely. And I, I will say that I strongly recommended we get out of there in uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, everybody looked at me like, uh, you know, I had something strange growing out of my forehead. Uh, I've never been comfortable with either the nuclear weapons or heavy dependence on air bases there. And you'll recall that <clears throat> in 2003, uh, the Turkish government refused us access through Anatolia into Iraq. Right. This is a long right. time coming. There's a lot of bitterness and resentment. You've got to remember that Turks also look back on their history and say, well, look, we went to Korea to fight with you against the North Koreans. You know, did the Israelis go? The Turks say, no, we did. We're your allies. Uh, I don't think the Turks feel as though they have been treated with the degree of respect and dignity that they deserve. But then they're part of a big club that includes most of the Islamic world. Right. I, so I think we've got a couple of problems here. We're not going to be able to provide the kind of support that guarantees Israel's survival as we were in the past. We, we no longer have the military power. Now, somebody can say, well, we have a nuclear deterrent, nuclear power. Well, uh, perhaps there are people in Israel who have convinced themselves that we will launch nuclear weapons at Iran or Turkey or Egypt or Saudi Arabia, anybody who dares threaten the existence of Israel. I don't think so. I'm someone that has never really believed in extended deterrence. I never believed that we were going to nuke Soviet forces if they tried to invade Germany, because everybody always knew what the outcome would be, total annihilation for everyone. And that's why we built up this strong conventional force of NATO. So I think the Israelis are up against the clock. They've got to do what they want to do and get it over with, which is going to be very tough. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this on this. And, and uh, before we get you off here, I, I definitely want to hear you. I like to put some of our guests uh, in, a, in a challenging, difficult position. And so I'll say, OK, so if this afternoon Netanyahu uh, texts you and says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm stuck here. I've, I've kind of gotten over my skis. I don't really know how to get this done in a way that's going to actually succeed for us. And he asks you, OK, given the circumstances and all the mess that exists right now, what should his his end state be? Uh, and, and an attainable end state, and how can we prevent this from escalating further? Uh, well, the first point is that I'm not sure we can at this at this stage. I think escalation in the future is inevitable. Someone said to me, well, it looks like we'll have a ceasefire and maybe this war in Gaza will end and we'll come to some sort of new settlement. I'm very skeptical of that for the reasons that I've already outlined. I, I think the proverbial red line for the Muslim world has been crossed by Israel. Israel is now finding itself at war with the entire Islamic world. Israel is going to be isolated from a large part of the rest of the world. 
we are going to end up being Israel's only true friend, period. How, how, how much can that work to sustain Israel is the question, and I'm not sure it can. I, I think we may see lulls in the fighting, temporary ceasefires, then I see, think it will erupt again and again until ultimately the entire region is involved and crushes Israel. That's, well, and, and that, that, that's what I fear right now is, is looking at this objectively as I can. I agree with you. I think that a Rubicon has been crossed, that the hatred now among Israelis for the for the Arabs and the Palestinians is now almost I don't know that it can be healed, certainly not in a generation and vice versa. The, the hatred is so great. I don't think the two sides can live in peace anymore, certainly not in the foreseeable future. And so that says, OK, either Israel decides to all right, I'm not going to do what I said, and I'm going to allow the the uh, Palestinians to continue to, to live here and to self-sustain, and knowing that Netanyahu's claim of wanting to end the threat won't end, or they go the other path and say, all right, then we're going to drive them all out, and we're going to get rid of all the Arabs out of the West Bank and Palestine, and we're going to have one Israel, but then that would almost certainly spark a, a regional war against Israel, just like you said. I just don't see a place to thread the needle. I don't see any way that, that it avoids those outcomes. Can you see something I don't see? Uh, frankly, at this point, no. I think uh, the Israelis will press ahead uh, and uh, they will empty Gaza of most of its population, if not all of it. And uh, Gaza will be destroyed. Now, at that point, I think it's a uh, full stop because if they, even though there are many who would like to press ahead in the West Bank of Palestine, I, I don't think that that's going to happen. Uh, so I think bef the result will be this regional alliance that coalesces and all agrees that this is the end. Israel must be eliminated, must be destroyed. <clears throat> Again, I don't know how you stop that other than calling an immediate halt right now and saying we've gone as far as we can go. We want an end to this. And uh, even then, it will be very difficult to return to some kind of normalcy. Yeah. You know, the, the thing the thing is that people say, well, the Israelis are winning on the ground, but they're losing the PR war. I don't see this as a win on the ground. Uh, I, I just don't. It's, it's so in seeds for, for what's going to follow on next. It's it's not going to solve. They're tactically succeeding in their tactical objectives today, but it may be laying the groundwork for something much worse later. I don't, no one seems to be thinking that part through. Well, this is why I've said repeatedly if you are a, a strong supporter of Israel, and I've certainly felt fallen into that category over the years, I like them and I've worked with them. And I right. think they're wonderful people. I know you have. I want them to survive. But if you feel that way, you have an obligation to intervene and, and save these people from themselves. Exactly. And, I completely agree with that. And that hasn't happened. And nor do I expect it to happen because I, I just don't think we're we're the ones in control in Washington. Uh, you've well, got to... and, and I think even more fundamentally than that, Doug, I don't think that there is the, there, the human capacity in our senior leadership that has the the knowledge and the 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 confidence and the chutes by, if you want to use that word, to be able to lead hard, to do the hard right thing that can bring this to an end. I don't see, I see too many people that are have grown up in this time where everything's PR and spin, and now they don't know how to handle an actual crisis. And that's what really worries me because- I don't think we have the capacity to get this to thread any needles. Well, very few people are paying attention to what's happening in Iraq and Syria. And, uh, you know, again, uh, I, I strongly favored removing our forces from Iraq and Syria. And somebody said to me at the time, well, you, you can't do that. I said, why not? I said, well, they have to be there. I said, well, no, they don't. There's no particular strategic reason why we should maintain a presence. Our presence has been the problem. We need to remove it. And he said, oh, no, no, we're there for Israel. And I said, well, my experience with the Israelis is that they know a heck of a lot more about what's happening right. in Syria, or for that matter, even in Iraq, than we do. Uh, how do we help them? Well, we're a tripwire. Well, I, again, this goes back to my larger view about this extended deterrence nonsense. I think this age of tripwires is over. It's been over for some time. Yeah. And I, would like I don't want our troops to tripwire us into conflict. That's a bad use of our troops. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're sitting there, I'm sure it's very reassuring if you're a soldier or in the United States Army to know that, well, I'm doing my job as a tripwire because as soon as I'm killed, something else is supposed to happen. I, I don't agree with that. I don't see it working that way. 
But, you know, for the moment, here's some good news. For the moment, the Iranians are, they've got their fingers on the triggers, but they're sitting there. And unless we attack them directly, they won't act. So I hope we can avoid that. Because remember, you've got enormous, enormous amount of money that's been invested over years to drive us into war with Iran. Yeah, I, I think that would finish the region, finish us in the region, finish Israel. So you, I hope you've that got, you've got happen. Jack Keen, you've got uh, uh, Lindsey Graham, both cheerleading that on, even even the, in recent days. It's just really aggravating. And then uh, in the background sits Erdogan. And Erdogan is nothing if not patient and thoughtful. And uh, we need to watch carefully what he does with the forces at his disposal. But it would be a serious mistake to assume that his rhetoric is not serious. He yeah. said, eventually, Turkish soldiers will fight in Gaza. Think about it. Yeah, that. I know. He said that, and we just don't seem to believe it. But uh, we're going to leave it there for now, and uh, we definitely we'll have you back because this obviously is not going away anytime soon. Uh, this is going to continue on, and, and we are going to tap into your expertise again on that. And I just want to remind everybody as we cut loose to be sure and tune in to Doug on Rumble tomorrow to see his interview with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. That's going to be at 7.30 p.m. Is that right, Doug? Uh, I think so. 7.30 p.m., yeah. But but turn in, that's going to be really interesting. Thank you so much for coming, Doug. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you on our next deep dive. And we're going to continue to be unintimidated and uncompromised in telling you the, the hard truth, even if it's something that's not popular or that you may not even want to believe, but you're going to know the right information because we are absolutely looking out for you. And we're actually, actually going through this with you. We're all together in this. Thanks. We'll see you next time on Deep.